Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I am Ladi Akiri Dunwale, the headlines. Russian forces continue their attack on Donbass with a focus on the town of Severodonetsk. UN Refugee Agency says the war in Ukraine has pushed the worldwide total of displaced people beyond 100 million for the first time. And Davos exhibition to raise awareness as Ukrainian artists transform former Russia House ahead of the opening of the World Economic Forum. We are this morning learning more about the attacks on the city of Severodonetsk in the eastern Donbas region, where Russian forces have been focusing their efforts. The governor of Luhansk says that the city came under heavy bombardment from Moscow's forces trying to take the industrial area of the Donbas. Regional governor Sergei Hedai says Russian forces were, quote, using scotch urch tactics deliberately destroying the city. Mr. Hedai says Moscow was drawing uh, forces withdrawn from the Kharkiv region, others involved in Mariupol's siege, pro-Russian separatist militias and even troops freshly mobilized from Siberia to concentrate on the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Meanwhile, more than 100 pe million people have been driven from their homes around the world, according to the UN Refugee Agency, citing new data and adding that the war in Ukraine was one of the factors propelling millions to flee. The UNHCR added that protracted conflict in places like Ethiopia and the Democratic Republic of Congo were other factors behind the high numbers. Nearly 6.5 million people have now fled the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says Ukraine may be losing between 50 and 100 lives in the eastern part of the country every day. Speaking during a press briefing, Mr. Zelensky said those killed were defending Ukraine in the most difficult direction. Mr. Zelensky did not elaborate uh, on his comments, but they appear to be a reference to military losses and a sign of how fierce the fighting in the east has been. And Mr. Zelensky said he is preparing for, quote, maximum diplomatic activity in this week. In his nightly address to Ukrainians, Mr. Zelensky said he would join discussions at the Davos Forum today and that those discussions will also take place between a new group of country representatives that will result in new meaningful decisions for Ukraine's defense. Mr. Zelensky said he had spoken to British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and was seeking to increase agricultural exports from Ukraine as well as fuel exports. Speaking to the Ukrainian parliament earlier, alongside Polish President Andrzej Duda, President Zelensky renewed a plea for stronger economic sanctions against Moscow. I'm preparing to start the new week with the maximum diplomatic activity in the interests of our state. On Monday, I will join the discussions at the Davos Forum. This is the world's most influential economic platform where Ukraine has points to make. There will be a new meeting of partner country representatives, Ramstein II, if this group can be named after the place of its first meeting in Germany, we are expecting new, meaningful decisions for our defense. In the evening, I spoke with Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson. I told Boris about our meeting, about the talks, about the situation on the battlefield. We are looking for ways to increase volumes of our exports, especially agricultural products, as well as the volume of fuel imports to Ukraine. Meanwhile, the Polish president had delivered a message of strong support for Ukraine during the first address in person by a foreign leader to the parliament in Kiev since the Russian invasion began. 
He urged the European Union and leaders of its member countries to let Ukraine join the bloc. During his speech, Mr. Andrzej Duda thanked Ukraine for defending Europe against what he called Russian imperialism. Poland has been one of Ukraine's staunchest supporters, taking in millions of refugees fleeing the fighting and sending tanks and rocket launches to the Ukrainian military. Mr. Duda received a standing ovation after his speech said Poland would do everything it could to help Ukraine join the European Union. Most importantly, I repeat it once again, a huge appeal to the whole European Union and its leaders. Today, Ukraine needs our signal that the European door is open for Ukraine as a country and its society. Ukraine wants to be a part of the European community. It is obvious that Ukraine should be rebuilt using war reparations from the invaders from Russia. They should be taken from assets, frozen in financial institutions all around the world due to being Russian assets. Apart from that, we need different kinds of initiatives that will help Ukraine directly. It was a sign of respect without precedent from the Polish parliament and the Polish people to pass the regarding law in a moment when Ukrainians needed it very much. Our government should demonstrate mutual respect. The draft law will be in the Ukrainian parliament, and I'm convinced that the parliament will vote for it with a secure majority. In responding to the Polish president, President uh, Zelensky said the Ukrainian and Polish nations were united and could not be divided as he welcomed his Polish counterpart, Andrzej Duda, to Kiev. Mr. Zelensky called Mr. Duda a friend and brother and said there should be no borders or barriers between the two countries. He thanked him for the assistance to Ukrainian refugees and promised reciprocal rights for Poles in Ukraine. Poland has granted the right to live and work and claim social security payments to over 3 million Ukrainian refugees fleeing Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And staying in Ukraine, it has extended martial law for three months until the 23rd of August. President Vladimir Zelensky first signed a decree along with the General Military Mobilization Call on the 24th of February and since then has extended it for a month on two occasions. On Sunday, Ukraine's parliament voted by an absolute majority for a third extension as Russia continues to focus its offensive on the eastern Donbas region. Mr. Zelensky's representative at the Constitutional Court, Fedor Venilovsky, says the decision to extend it for 90 days this time is because a counteroffensive takes more time than defense. Under martial law, Ukrainian men aged 18 to 60 are banned from leaving the country unless they have special exemptions. A verdict is expected in the first war crimes trial to be held in Ukraine since this war started. Russian soldier Vadim Shishmiran, at 21, had pleaded guilty to killing an unarmed civilian a few days after the invasion began. Prosecutors say Shishimarin was commanding a unit in a tank division when his convoy came under attack. He and four other soldiers stole a car, and as they traveled near Chupakiva, they encountered the 62-year-old man on a bicycle. According to prosecutors, Shishimarin was ordered to kill the civilian and use the Kalashnikov assault rifle to do so. The soldier faces life in jail. Ukraine has so far identified more than 10,000 possible war crimes said to have been committed by Russia. Russian media says uh, Russian and Luhansk forces now control 95 percent of the land of that region. The Russian Defense Ministry said its forces attacked Ukrainian command centers and troops, as well as ammunition depots in Donetsk and Luhansk with high-precision missiles uh, in the last 24 hours. And the mayor of the Russian-held city of Enagorda in southern, uh, southeast Ukraine and two of his security guards were injured in an explosion uh, overnight. The blast occurred in the entranceway of an apartment block where the mother of Mayor Andrei Shevchik reportedly resides. An improvised explosive device was planted inside an electrical distribution box. The mayor had recently received numerous threats from the Ukrainian side. 
No resident of the apartment block were affected by the explosion, according to local media. And Agudar is home of the Zaporizhzhia nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe. Let's talk now to Dr. Charles Omole, Global Security Expert, Director General, Institute of Police and Security Policy Research, uh, who joins us uh, uh, virtually. Uh, good morning, Doctor. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. The situation is, as has been predicted, slowly uh, becoming a grinding battle. Uh, all the dramatic movements that seem to have been seen in the first couple of weeks have uh, since disappeared. Uh, do you think perhaps it is time, especially because the Russians now say they are ready to sit down for negotiations, do you think it is possible that the Ukrainians too may also be thinking that perhaps it is time to once again sit down? Well, I mean, uh, this was this this uh, war was always going to end in, in negotiated uh, negotiated settlement all along. Um, clearly, you need to be aware of the historical basis for Russia's position. Um, the challenge Russia has is that I think it has used the wrong method to assert uh, what some public will say is a legitimate concern. Uh, every global superpower we have from China to U.S., even to European countries, everybody have what they call the sphere of influence, where what happens there affects them, even though those places are independent countries. We saw that, for example, in the 60s, when the Soviet Union relocated some missile to Cuba. Cuba was an independent country. The America was willing to go to war, nuclear war, if needed. Because of that, you know, so there's an element of uh, hypocrisy in the way Western is, the West is perceived as dealing with or ignoring uh, Russia concern. Because in 1991, when the Soviet Union broke into 15 different countries, Ukraine was the second largest uh, country within the USSR. And if you look at the map of uh, East, Eastern Europe today, every country that surrounds Russia except Belarus, Ukraine, and Georgia. They're all members of NATO. So Russia is feeling kind of closed up by all these NATO countries. Uh, and NATO means American troops, American weapons can be stationed there. So all I think initially Russia was seeking was some form of buffer between Russia and NATO. And it saw Ukraine, as the largest of the countries with 44 million people and massive landmass, has been the best buffer between Russia and Europe. So but when the West continued the expansion into uh, all those areas, Russia felt it had to act. And so what's happening now is I feel the negotiated, set, uh, negotiated settlement will involve around recognition of Russia's old on Crimea and some form of Russian influence in the Donbass region. Uh, that, I think, might be the roadmap to a solution. Given the situation on ground, however, it does appear that uh, the Russians, as you said, may have had genuine concerns, but uh, they've gone about it with the wrong method. And one of the consequences of that wrong method is that both Sweden and Finland are now on the verge of joining NATO, although uh, there is opposition to their joining from Turkey. Turkey, incidentally, was one of the peacemakers in the early stages of this war, trying to bring Ukraine and Russia together. They didn't exactly succeed with that. And they are opposed to uh, uh, Sweden and Finland joining NATO because of what they say are domestic security concerns that they have as well. So how do you see all of that playing in, in this? Uh, many people expected that it was quite possible that Russia would go after both Sweden and Finland uh, for attempting to join NATO. They had, in fact, said they would. Uh, and what they've done so far is that they've cut off gas supplies uh, 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 to Finland over the weekend. They did that on Saturday. And uh, the reports are that Sweden is next. So how do you see all of that playing into this? Well, I mean, I mean, you've you've nailed it. This is actually is a problem. Also, when when you hear NATO, people need to understand 
what was the origin of NATO? Why was NATO started? NATO started as a military ally, as a North Atlantic Treaty Alliance against, against the old Soviet Union. So NATO started as an anti-USSR organization. So fine, they might have modified slightly their focus, but the idea still, from the, at least from Moscow's perspective, that is NATO is against us. So moving NATO assets to countries around Russia who make Russia feels very vulnerable and very jittery. And that, I think, is a problem. And I think what uh, Russia probably will learn from this war in um, Ukraine is that what it could do in terms of in terms of the new countries trying to join will be more economic pressure rather than military action, because uh, it's clear that the Russian military is not the uh, it's not what it's, it used to be. We can see that in um, Ukraine how it did not really perform very well. So I don't think they will go for a new military offensive against those countries. They probably will use more softer economic and other pressure on those countries. But, with, but, but when it comes to Ukraine, though, that is a different kettle of fish. I don't think the Ukrainian border that was agreed in 1991 uh, uh, would ever remain uh, sort of acceptable to, acceptable to Russia going forward. Given that, uh, let's let's look at it now, because when we, when, when we were talking a bit earlier when this war started in the first couple of weeks, there were those who said neither side was interested in peace because they wanted more military leverage from ground, and then they would come to the table. Uh, um, there are those who say that Russia is too strong. It is unlikely that Ukraine, even with all the help it is getting, will ever prevail against Russia. But that because of that help, Russia may also not prevail in any decisive fashion. So is there now wind? Is there wind, shall we say, towards some kind of uh, accommodation, either along the lines you have already indicated, or perhaps with both sides giving up one thing or the other so that this war can stop or end? Well, I mean, um, that, that, that's that's a good question. I mean, the way the way I see this is the fact that Russia's first attempt to, uh, you know, strike across Ukraine, I don't think, in my analysis, was due to the fact that they wanted to take over the entire country. I think it's much of a scotch earth policy. They just want to destroy the country. Russia's interest has always been the Donbas region where they have more support on the ground. By the time you move towards the western side of Ukraine, support for Russia is in some places as little as 5% or less. Whereas if you go to Donbass region, you are seeing 60, sometimes 70% of the local people supporting Russia because they have more affinity with Russia. So that area has always been Russia's, uh, I, I think, focus. But they expanded it initially just to, you know, I think maybe just to punish Ukraine, just destroy things. In terms of uh, whether there is st enough military stalemate to bring everybody to the table? The answer is probably yes. But if you look at this, you know, sometimes look at the performance and responses of the president of Ukraine. Uh, prior to that invasion, all Russia was asking at some point was an assurance that you are not going to join NATO. And I'm 100% certain that any agreement to end this war will involve some form of aetos to uh, Ukraine joining NATO because that would never be acceptable to acceptable to uh, acceptable to Russia under Putin. So, in a way, what could have what could end the war is what could have prevented the war, which is Ukraine saying, "Okay, we are not joining NATO for now," and that probably could have prevented this. But the bellicose stance of the uh, you know the Ukrainian president being egged on by the West. I think uh, was a bit too strong and discountenanced all the concerns of Russia completely. And I think right now, both parties probably are in that place where they can find a solution, uh, but it will involve NATO pulling back on its expansion into Ukraine, I think. Indeed, Dr. Charles Omole, thank you very much. Dr. Omole is, is the Director General of the Institute for Police and Security Policy Research. He joined us virtually from the nation's capital, Abuja. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. After the break, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says New Zealand is to offer more support in training Ukrainian forces. Please stay with us.
thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. Russian soldiers have entered the industrial grounds of Mariupol's Azovstal steelworks as part of an operation to clear mines and debris from the area. Soldiers walked through the compound and swung mine detectors over roads littered with debris, while some checked under objects for explosive devices. The operation saw mines detonated in controlled explosions and debris cleared from the steelworks roads using military bulldozers. One Russian serviceman said the landmines were planted by both Ukrainian and Russian forces, with over 100 mines being cleared by the operation in the last two days. Drone footage also captured the extensive damage to the steelworks buildings, where a weeks-long siege trapping Ukrainian fighters inside the compound ended in surrender last week. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has said that her country would deploy an extra 30 Defence Force personnel to the United Kingdom to support the training of Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian armed forces. The troops training ammunition and surplus equipment, including aiming systems, will be moved in an airlift coordinated by the United Kingdom. This follows a previous deployment of 66 New Zealand Defence Force personnel in April, along with the Royal New Zealand Air Force C-130 Hercules aircraft. Ms. Arden made it clear that New Zealand soldiers would be based in the UK and would not enter Ukraine. And Ukrainian presidential adviser Mikhailo Polyak has ruled out a ceasefire with Russia and said Kiev would not accept any deal with Moscow that involved ceding territory. Acknowledging that Kiev's stance on the war was becoming more uncompromising, the presidential adviser said making concessions would backfire on Ukraine because Russia would hit back harder after any break in fighting. Mr. Poldiak dismissed this very strange cause in the West for an urgent ceasefire that would involve Russian forces remaining in territory that they have occupied in Ukraine's south and east. Both sides have uh, said peace talks have stagnated. Because any concession to the Russian Federation would instantly lead to an escalation of the war, so the war will not stop. It would just be put on pause for some time. After a while, with renewed intensity, the Russians will build up their weapons, manpower, and work on their mistakes, modernize a little, fire many generals who are absolutely ineffective. This is Soviet level of generals, so the planning of the military operations and so on. They will fire the generals, try to modernize the general staff, and they will start a new offensive, even more bloody and large scale, taking into account all mistakes. So today, they stake their bets on the next phase of the war. The one currently taking place in eastern Ukraine, they want to lock in some kind of military success. Certainly, they're not going to have military successes, given the help that our Western partners are giving to us now. There will be no success, but the war will drag on Meanwhile, Russia's lead negotiator in peace talks with Ukraine says that Moscow was willing to resume negotiations, but that the decision remained with Kiev. Uh, Vladimir Medinsky had told Belarusian TV that freezing talks was entirely Ukraine's initiative, adding that the ball is completely in their court. He spoke a day after Mr. Zelensky had said the war will only definitively end through diplomacy. Joining us from our Abuja studios is Ambassador Haroon Umar, who is a retired uh, diplomat. Uh, your Excellency, thank you for your time. Welcome uh, this morning. Yeah, thank you very much. The last two uh, stories, uh, the last two stories that I read uh, seem to signify where we are with the war. The Ukrainians saying that there will be no peace talks uh, that involve any kind of ceding of territory. The Russians saying that, well, that's the decision of Ukraine. They are ready to resume talks at any point in time. Is this a fair assessment of the situation on the ground as at today? Yes, that is it. And uh, I think that uh, Ukraine is not being realistic. But I'm not surprised. Uh, Ukraine is being prompted by the massive support it is getting or she is getting from West. If you recall, uh, the US president has just signed a bill uh, to support 
the Ukraine with $40 billion. And uh, even the EU has uh, agreed to uh, support the Ukraine with about $13 billion. Now, the Ukraine is uh, suffering from lack of exports of its commodities, which would have brought down its economy. But now with this support, of financial support, then uh, it is feeling bold, it is feeling strong to continue to make bold face in the face of the destruction of its people and its country. And uh, I am not really in support, or let me say, I am not really happy with the approach of the West, including the US. They are prom prompting Ukraine to destruction instead of prompting Ukraine to peace. And this destruction and this war in general is not in the interest of not only Ukraine, it's not in the interest of, the Euro of Europe, it's not in the interest of America, and it is gradually pervading the whole world, economically and uh, security-wise. Now, uh, economically, you can see that we are facing uh, shortages, food, in many countries. There is food shortage. Many countries relied on Ukraine and Russia for wheat and barley. Many countries rely on Ukraine or Russia for energy. And uh, these two combined will definitely bring down the economy of each country. Most Europe, many European countries will fall under this. Other countries uh, like Egypt will also be affected. Even the United States is going to be affected through energy shortage. Now, how can this be in the interest of Ukraine? And now Ukraine is still thinking that with this support it's getting from uh, Europe and America, it can withstand, it will stand uh, the, the, the ferocious war against Russia. They are, of course, getting some intelligence and uh, uh, strategic weapons, which is making them to, uh, to put a stop at the onslaught of the Russian. But for how long? For how long will this be? So I think that uh, uh, the stand of Ukraine is, uh, if you leave me, I would say infantile. They are not being real realistic. They are not what would be, what, what, what do you and, think uh, would be, what do you think would be the realistic options on ground for both? Uh, you, you did uh, reference the fact that Ukraine is actually suffering. Uh, it's, it's, the country has been destroyed, the territory has been affected, uh, and that, you know, perhaps they needed to be more pragmatic. But then Russia is not escaping unscathed either. Uh, the Russian economy is being badly affected as well. Uh, a lot of what would have been income to it is frozen uh, outside of Russia. Payment systems have expelled it. Many countries, uh, many companies uh, that are not Russian have left Russia and so on. So one, why I raise that is because it does appear as if everyone is being affected. But the principle at sure. stake here, and I'm thinking as a diplomat, you would be able to speak to this, is that every country is sovereign and that therefore on the basic principle, uh, you shouldn't get to decide what happens in another country. Oh, sure. Uh, decision, whatever a country decides for itself, I think if it is realistic or pragmatic should be in the interest of that country. What do you stand to gain by joining NATO if your country will be destroyed? Now, even as it is now, if the war stops, and let's say Russia accedes to the demand that it allows Ukraine to be NATO member. Now, what how long it will take to build up, to, 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 to rebuild the country is a setback. It's not an achievement. So why not? 
why not stop this and just accept? And if you leave me, I'm just wondering, for goodness sake, what is the purpose? What is the main benefit Ukraine will get by being a NATO member? And uh, how does it help in the, uh, to prop up the strength, the, 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 the economy, the well-being of the people? So this uh, is not uh, really in the interest of, uh, uh, of uh, Ukraine. But like you said, uh, Russia is uh, feeling the pinch. It's definitely feeling the pinch, but so also is Europe, so also is Ukraine, so also is the United States. Everybody is feeling the pinch. Now, I think that they will continue to feel the pinch until that time when, when uh, everybody is, uh, is worn down. Maybe when it is, people feel that they have come to the end, end of it, then, uh, I mean, they have, when they feel that uh, enough is enough, then we'll have a ray of hope. But you see, as it is now, the, the, the situation, people, they, they, both sides are just, uh, just making the war more and more difficult, bringing, it, uh, uh, bringing the solution to the war more difficult to, to, to perform. If you look at the, 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 the efforts of the United States, it is, uh, for instance, it has a bill in the Congress now to punish African countries who support Russia. You know, is this telling us that uh, we are, they are on the way to get a solution to the war? They have also gone to Asia they are fanning up the old rivalries, China and the South, South China Sea, uh, the, 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 the problem between China and India, between, you know, trying to gain support. And, uh, you know, they have also somehow uh, toned down the support of India to Russia by offering them strategic uh, equipments, uh, weapon equipment. You know, so this, I think, is not the best way to go about getting peace in, uh, in the war. And it is really affecting almost everybody. I was reading, uh, 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 I was uh, listening to a video clip on the, uh, on the social media saying that if as it is, we continue like this, Europe, most of European countries will be broke because they will be short of energy, they will be short of uh, uh, food, food supplies, and uh, the economy will be brought down. Already, inflation has gone hyper in most of these countries. So what is the benefit? Why all this? Why the rush? Why are they also being hypocritical, if I should say it? Maybe I'm being too, too harsh. Let me say they are using multiple multiple, uh, 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 double standard, multiple standard. When it, is, it was right for the US to threaten nuclear war, when the Soviet Union stationed its uh, nuclear warheads in Cuba, and everybody held that because they felt threatened by the presence of those nuclear warheads in Cuba. So why can't they see the, the threatening effects of Ukraine being a member of NATO, where same nuclear weapons can be stationed, American nu 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 nuclear warheads could be stationed in, in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Russia. Clearly, Russia will have to continue this because it is being threatened. If it allows this to happen, there will one day be no Russia. I mean, that is how they're seeing it. And of course, uh, Putin has already made the threat that rather than to have no Russia, then let the world finish. Uh, he was ready to deploy, I mean, to use nuclear power against any country. And if they, it means the end of the world, so it, so it be it. And uh, they continue to cycle and cycle Russia. So that if they succeed, they will squeeze Russia, and then there will be no Russia. I mean, look at it this way. There will be no Russia if they squeeze Russia the way they are going. So it is really going to be uh, a dicey situation. 
no matter, I think Russia will continue this until its demands, or let me say substantial demands have been met with. And uh, it will also not uh, permit the, the presence of uh, nuclear weapons uh, in its doorsteps. That's uh, my, my take on this. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency Ambassador Harun Omar. Thank you so much for your perspective. Most Ambassador uh, uh, Omar Most joining welcome. us from our Abuja studios. Ukraine's uh, parliament has voted to end a double taxation agreement with Russia, which had been in place since 1995 and in which Russian residents operating in Ukraine were exempt from paying Kiev's taxes and could be taxed by their home country only. Ukraine's finance minister said that now all residents or all income of residents of the Russian Federation received from sources in Ukraine will be subject to a general tax rate of 15 percent established by the tax code of Ukraine instead of preferential rates established by the double taxation agreement. The ministry also said Ukrainian residents operating in Russia will equally no longer be able to pay Moscow's taxes. Russia's Gazprom uh, uh, over the weekend halted gas exports to a neighboring Finland in the latest escalation of an energy payments dispute with Western nations. Gazprom export has demanded that European countries pay for Russian gas supplies in rubles because of sanctions imposed over Moscow's invasion of Ukraine, but Finland refuses to do so. Let's talk to our business correspondent, Ladi Williams, uh, joins me here. Hi, Ladi. <laughs> good morning, Ladi. Well, they've made their good their threat. Yes, because I was going to say <laughs> this is no surprise. They had said they were going to do this. Exactly. They already did it. They already did it before. Right. Uh, so this is just yeah, another Bulgaria country. And, uh, yeah, they, Poland got, they did it with Bulgaria. They did Poland. Now it's the turn of Finland, Finland. to feel the heat. Is it the heat or the cold? Exactly. Depending on how you look at it. <laughs> and obviously that, you know, was motivated you know, with uh, Finland's uh, application to join uh, NATO. And that kind of fast-tracked, you know, this um, uh, 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 stoppage of gas flowing into Finland. And obviously, we've seen how, you know, the, 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 the Russian government have been able to strengthen the ruble, you know, with some of these, you know, actions, actions. especially with, you know, receiving payments for gas, you know, in ruble. But now Finland is saying, you know, we're not, we're not going to pay, you know, in ruble. But... The truth is most of European countries actually rely heavily, you know, on Russia for their gas needs. But Finland also, you know, relies on Russia, but the, the gas only, uh, you know, provides about 5 percent, you know. So they, their, could, they could really so do they without could it. they could actually, you know, do without it, even though they still need it for most of their industrial, you know, activities. You know, but at this point, they have other forms. They have uh, renewable energy. They have uh, other sources from uh, wood and, you know, electricity. So they're able to diversify, you know, their needs when it comes to, you know, gas. So they don't really rely on gas for their heating and all of that because they use a lot of electricity. But at the same time, they also need gas, but not as much as other European uh, countries for their industrial uh, uses and, you know, when it comes to chemical uh, uses, they still need gas. But they're saying, you know what, if it's uh, for Finland to pay in ruble, we're not going to do that. We have, and, and we can make alternative we arrangements. Can make, yeah, they already, you know, they've already made arrangements for another, you know, gas supply from Estonia, you know, and other uh, Baltic uh, regions at this point. So for Finland, so others outside will say, okay, this is, this is a big blow you know, to Finland. But at the end of the day, Finland is saying we can actually manage this. Most of their, you know, businesses there are saying we can manage for now, you know, without Russian gas. So it's not uh, really impacting them as much as other countries, Please. you know, in, in Europe. So they are not, that's, that's the good thing about, you know, diversifying your sources. And we're seeing it work for Finland. For Finland now. Russia is making early debt repayments to dodge a default. Uh, we've talked about this. Uh, but what is this specific one now? Why are they making a dodge? And what's exactly. The so, you know, we've seen how these sanctions have stopped, you know, uh, Russia from making, you know, most of their bond payments that, you know, they've been, they've been struggles, you know. And obviously we've seen investors quite uh, nervous, you know, at this point, holders of Russian bond, they're nervous. But at this point, you see that uh, Russia is saying, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the United States allowed Russia make some of these payments, you know, with a waiver, you know, to allow them make, 
you know, payments to their bondholders. But now that uh, waiver is going to expire. And the U.S. is, you know, looking to... And not renewing it. Not renew it and make for that uh, default. It's called a technical default because we know Russia can pay and they are willing to pay. But because of these sanctions, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be like a technical default, which would not, you know, look good for uh, Russia's uh, image out there. So this uh, waiver is going to expire, uh, say, sometime next week, around 25th of May, and, uh, or this week, actually. But uh, Russia said, you know what, let's quickly make some payments, you know, ahead of time, you know, before the waiver actually expires, which is a move to make sure, okay, they're safe, you know, throughout May. They'll now have to start looking for other options, you know, when this one actually expires. But this is a move to take off, you know, most of the pressure for their, uh, their bond payments, you know, for this uh, month. They, we know they've been looking for all the alternatives, you know, yes. being taken off SWIFT yeah. and, uh, you know, with all the financial sanctions that have, you know, been leveled on Russia. But uh, it remains to be seen how they will function, you know, after this uh, waiver expires. We know how they've uh, tried to, you know, make other alternatives at this point. But it remains to be seen if these alternatives, by paying in ruble, you know, would actually work because we know these bonds are denominated in U.S. Uh, dollars. dollars. So yeah. uh, for, for them to make payment in ruble, that would also mean a default. Laddie, so. you're, not, you're not going any place. <laughs> we're, we're due for a very short break. We'll take a break when we come back. This has impact here in Nigeria as well. Right. I'll talk to you about that right after this break. So please stay with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. Laddie Williams is still here. Laddie, uh, the central bank here in Nigeria is promising that it's going to continue intervening in critical sectors. Right. Partly or majorly because of this war in Ukraine. Of course, it had been intervening before this, right. but now it's going to do this. What, what, what's that yeah, about? They're taking a step further this time. We've seen, you know, central bankers all over the world, you know, try to tame, you know, inflation, inflation at this point, yes. which, is, uh, which was already on the rise, but has been stoked more with this... Uh, uh, war in Ukraine. We've seen how, you know, food uh, security now is becoming an issue globally because obviously we know uh, Ukraine is, you know, a, 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 a breadbasket, you know, when it comes to uh, most of these agricultural commodities. Most of them come from there, especially wheat uh, from uh, uh, sunflower oil, you know, and Africa has you know, felt the impact of these, especially uh, North Africa and also most parts of Africa. We've seen the cost of bri uh, bread actually rise at this point, right. yeah. as we're seeing, you know, cost of wheat go up. And also Russia also, you know, uh, provides a lot of wheat, you know, for the world. But now we're seeing um, this also impact inputs into manufacturing. So the Central Bank of Nigeria is indicating that they will be showing more preference right now to agriculture, and the manufacturing industry. We've seen how these uh, the uh, oil prices have increased energy prices globally. We're feeling the squeeze all over the world. So we've seen the price of diesel actually skyrocket yeah. here in Nigeria. So the central bank is, you know, looking at supporting, you know, agriculture and manufacturing so that, because the manufacturers, it's hard for them, you know, to manufacture at these times with rising energy costs, raw materials, you know, importing all these raw materials is becoming more difficult with the supply uh, chain disruptions we're seeing because, you know, of this war. So, and at the end of the day, we're seeing also fertilizer. Fertilizer is a, is a big problem right now. Fertilizer prices have gone up and we need fertilizer, you know, for uh, crop production. So with crop production being threatened, you know, at this point all over the world, it's uh, become imperative for the central bank to actually look at ways of supporting these industries from agriculture to uh, manufacturing. They're meeting today for uh, the, the MPC meeting. They're going to be meeting today and tomorrow we're going to be having their uh, decision, you know, for rates. Uh, you know, we've seen how other central bankers... That's have, it. You know, I, I was raised. going to ask you, I was going to put you on the spot by asking you <laughs> oh, if, if there are any fillers as to whether we're also going to witness a, so, some a analysts, massive rate, rate rise. Some analysts are saying it's, there's a possibility, you know, they might want to follow, you know, what's going on with other central bankers. We, uh, we see the Fed raise rates That's twice. Right. You know, but some are also saying, you know what, the fragile growth we've seen 
you know, in Nigeria, they would not want to disrupt that. Because at the end of the day, it's a tough decision for any central banker right now. Raising rates, you know, raises the risk of, of a recession. That's right. And, you know, right now, the central bank of Nigeria is not, I don't think they are willing to risk you know, a recession at this point because the growth is really fragile from, you know, COVID-19. Yeah, you know, we're just coming now. out of that. We're just coming out of that. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of uh, divided right now. Some analysts believe they might raise uh, rates, but some also say, you know what, the, the central bank is not willing to risk a recession. Even though we're seeing other central bankers actually take that take risk. Take that risk, that's it. You know, right now with the Fed actually looking at more aggressive rate hikes of in about 75 uh, basis points. Yeah, we've seen how that has rattled, you know, most markets at this point. But and will also rattle ours. And will rattle ours too, you know, increasing the cost of borrowing and all of that. So it remains to be seen, but we'll be covering that Yes. Right here, live. Live, yes. Yeah, Today and tomorrow, to be exact. Today and tomorrow. And then, of course, we'll, we'll get Decision to hear the decisions yes. tomorrow. We'll, we'll cover that live. All right, then, Aladi, uh, thank you for the perspective. Uh, as you've just heard him say, we're there with uh, the MPC meeting today and tomorrow and the decisions. Uh, you want details on the perspective? Watch uh, Business Morning right after this program and then Business Incorporated. Aladi, thanks. Thank you. Ukrainians are sheltering in subway stations in Kharkiv have started returning home as the city resumed its public transport system earlier after a long break. For weeks, one metro station in Ukraine's second largest city accommodated around 500 residents to shelter amidst the fierce fighting between Ukrainian and Russian forces. Galina Shivka lived in the metro station for over two months. She said the conditions got better over time. Shivka was finally able to go home as she said goodbye to her fellow Ukrainians she also wanted to part with the suffering. Yevgenia Zukovina, her neighbor, updated her on events while she was away. Zukovina said the building would often shake amidst constant shelling while people hid in its basement. Shivka said it's time to start a new life, one that she hopes is peaceful and quiet. Russian military advanced towards Kiev in February. The village of Moschun was right in its way. The fighting and shelling destroyed many buildings and infrastructure, and most of its people were evacuated. Some three months later, they start to return and see what's left of their houses and businesses. Grocery shop owner Kaneda Konstenko is one of them. Konstenko was lucky her grocery shop remained intact. Some of the ceiling panels came down, however, and the roof needs fixing. But she's more concerned about her customers. Last week, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky proposed a formal deal with the country's allies to secure Russian compensation for the damage its forces have caused during the war. Zeneda Konsteko would certainly welcome that. It would get a normal life back for her and her family. In the sports news, Ukraine's defender Alexander Zinchenko has dedicated Manchester City's dramatic Premier League title triumph to his wartime homeland. City retained the title on the last day of the season as they came from two goals down to beat Aston Villa 3-2 at the Etihad Stadium. Zinchenko played a role in City's epic success as the left back came off the bench at halftime to help spark their fight back. Zinchenko was overcome by emotion, draping the Premier League trophy in the Ukrainian yellow and blue flag during the post-March celebrations. Players were disappointed about the absence of ranking points at this year's Wimbledon, but have grudgingly accepted the governing body's decision following the decision by the organizers to exclude players from Russia and Belarus due to Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. The world's most prestigious tennis tournament was stripped of its ranking points by the ATP and the WTA tours. Rankings determine a player's ability to enter tennis events and receive seedings, and the absence of them will reduce Wimbledon to an exhibition tournament. Well, losing today doesn't help much, but... Um, honestly, it's a very difficult decision. We've been talking a lot with the WTA. I wish uh, they can find a solution, uh, but I don't think anything will change with the no points. Um, obviously, um, a lot of players are disappointed. I wish we had points. I, if I did quarterfinal, for me, the main concern is how they're gonna they're gonna keep the last. Um, 
a year's points, how they're going to replace them, because it's not fair if we, we drop all the points without us defending anything, uh, especially some, some people had finals, semi-finals, so it is very, very tough decision, and I don't know, um, honestly, I'm just going to try to grab as much points as I can in, in the grass season, I mean, in the point, in the other tournaments. The decision that's been taken obviously wasn't taken lightly, and I think when you're backed into a corner and that's all you can do, I think that's why the decision was made, and I support it. I don't personally agree with the decision to, to ban ban the players from Russia and, and Belarus. So, but you know, the players would we would also prefer to be playing for points. So, but I get it. I I mean I. You know, I, I, I'm not saying the ATP has, has made a wrong decision, but you know we would prefer to be playing uh, with points. But I definitely stand with the ATP in, in the sense that I believe these players um, uh, should be playing. They don't um, have anything to do with the invasion going on. But you know, we all just want this. The whole world just wants this to um, come to an end somehow. And. It, it stinks that it's, you know, it's interfered with, with sports, but that's the way of the world now. The former Russian house at the World Economic Forum was transformed into a display of photographs and videos depicting the Ukrainian experience of the war. Now dubbed the Russian War Crimes House, the building is filled with visual records of the war and a map of alleged atrocities using data provided by the general prosecutor of Ukraine and Amnesty International. For the director of the Pinchuk Art Center in Kiev, John Veldov, the presence of world and business leaders in the Swiss city of Davos provided an important opportunity to raise awareness. Geneva based WEF says the meeting will bring together more than 2,000 leaders and experts from around the world, somewhat smaller than some past meetings. No government or corporate bigwigs from Russia were invited because of the Ukraine war. And finally, Bidu Chiao, a Chinese dissident artist, is showing his support for Ukraine in new work that has gone on display in Prague, while also taking aim at the leaders of Russia and China. The Chinese-born political cartoonist and artist, who goes by a pseudonym and has drawn comparisons to graffiti artist Bongse, is presenting six paintings on the Ukraine war, collectively entitled the Butterfly Effect of Kiev at Prague's of Docks Gallery. The paintings include one of a tank with the Z sign used by Russian forces on their armored vehicles and a girl in a Ukrainian folk costume putting a sunflower into the tank's barrel. But the chair said most of the work was dedicated to Ukrainians resisting Russia's invasion while also putting the blame not only on Mr. Putin, but also on China for supporting Russia. The exhibition by the artist who now lives in Australia has already drawn an official protest from the Chinese embassy in Prague, Doc's curator, uh, Michaela Silpochova, uh, told the media. Ms. Silpochova said the embassy called her directly and asked that the exhibition be cancelled because, as they said, it will harm relations between the Czech Republic and China. The Chinese embassy did not respond to requests for comment. To everybody who participated in this. Thank you, buddy, and have a great evening. And that's how we end uh, this Monday's show. Uh, to uh, join us at 5 o'clock, there'll be an update at that time. But do have a pleasant week ahead. I'm Ladi Akiri. Good morning.